record now with an eye towards our next quarry, which uh, concerns another set of slides that I have posted on calibration. We have much that lies before us this afternoon, calibration and hybrid modeling, and arguably most important of all, the incubator projects. I, I do not dare shortchange any one of them fully, but I, I will need to go through this with a brevity um, uncharacteristic of this boot camp. So, um, calibration in a nutshell, I think, is best illustrated interactively. And to that end, we will open any logic and conversely close the model we've already built, despite the many virtues that recommend it. And we will go to help and we will bring in a model well suited to illustrate the, in a visual fashion, calibration uh, basics. So we're gonna go to help and we're gonna go to example models, a resource that of which we have only sampled sparingly in this bootcamp, which, been, which um, offers many, many notable um, points of interest. I'd like you now to go to the SIR agent-based calibration. Where is it? It's down in the S's. This is um, alphabetical, and it is just above the sales funnel and just below the roundabout. Um, SIR agent-based model for calibration. Now, this model is a little bit, um, had has some, disadvantages um, and at times I've, I've kind of modified it to be a little bit more, a little bit less um, strained in its interpretation. But I'd like you to look at the calibration experiment in particular. Maybe before I do that, I'll just, in a closing remark on, on parameter variation, I'll note that there's this Monte Carlo TD histogram. If you run that, this is actually a stochastic run of the model, uh, stochastic um, uh, parameter, uh, stochastic um, sensitivity analysis, which runs the model very uh, many times. And for each time, it actually summarizes over time with what's called a 2D histogram model, model outcomes. Uh, and it'll run it again and again and again. And instead of that histogram, which we had previously, that histogram, those histograms which we were just using earlier, which summarize the results of a summary measure at the end of the model across different rounds of the model, where only one point comes out of the model um, for a given histogram, um, for a given run, um, for a given histogram. Here we are going to be capturing, it looks like it may be out of memory, judging judging by its having stopped and um, the old horse knows the way. It's out of memory. So um, uh, here we go, we're gonna go to it and we're going to raise the memory to 1024. La marche or two. So we're, we're raising it to uh, 1024, okay? And we're gonna run the model again. So that that particular, a scenario, raise it to uh, a gigabyte of memory, and it will perform less truculently. Um, so here it's running, and this is showing over time, that's the x-axis, the different runs which took place. So it summarizes in a given graph, variability and the time behavior of the model. You'll notice that there are some realizations which still have low values here. And there are some up here. Sometimes the infection never took off, sometimes it did took off. And I will note that the COVID-19 model that we built with the SHA, you know, has 
it makes extensive use of these 2D histogram type constructs, um, uh, variations on these. That, that's parameter variation. But now our goal is to illustrate calibration. So go up to calibration. I want you to run it, OK? Uh, we may need to, um, no, there's no memory uh, allocation. Oh, no, it is. Let's change this from 128 to 1024, OK? OK. Okay, here we go. Now, calibration is all about getting a model, tuning model parameters so that model results, emergent model results, model endogenous results generated from the model, best match, best match, observed data from the world. There's often a lot of data from the world that's not about one parameter. It's about, and, and it can't be taken and two-horned into one parameter, or one or two parameters, no, no, no. It's about emergent behavior in the world. It comes from all sorts of factors in the system. It's not about any one parameter. The number of hospitalizations for COVID-19 in a given week in the world is influenced, surely, by the probability a given person with, with COVID-19 develops severe symptoms. Certainly. But it's also influenced at some level. It's, it's influenced by the contact rate in the population as it was a short time ago. And it's influenced by the degree to which people are going out and mixing. And so, so with the contact rate and the degree to which they're wearing masks and the degree to which they've been vaccinated. It's associated with the number of individuals who are being found through, through um, uh, found early in their illness through testing in a way that might allow them to be uh, to, to be treated early with uh, Paxlovid or something like that. And so it's affected by a lot of things, these observations of the world. We can't take it and put it into a parameter. But what we can do, absent that, is ask our model to reproduce that data because that data from the world can be compared with comparable data, data about similar points in the system from the model. So here, what we're depicting is from the model historic data that's shown here in, in uh, yellow. And we're gonna try to match as we run the model that data from the world as closely as possible, okay? So this is gonna be our goal is to match this. Despite variability in the model across different runs of the model, we're going to try to tune the values. Uh, TAs, please seize any remaining food before it's thrown out. Um, if you could, we don't want to. We don't want to waste it. Thank you. It is good mouths that can be fed. Mouths such as your own. Um, so here, this is data we're trying to match, and we're going to try to tune the values of parameters we don't know well around which we have some uncertainty so that the model best matches the data. Typically, we're gonna have many of these types of bits of data about the world. Some may be curves, some may be, you know, we know it's much higher rates of, of um, undiagnosed gonorrhea in, in women compared to men, or maybe we know the disparities in rural areas uh, compared to urban or pronounced anyway. Um, thanks so much. Oh, fantastic, yeah. Don't let that furtado go to waste. Um, so, so here, ladies and gentlemen, we'll often have several things we want to uh, we want to match with the model, uh, and we're going to run the model and try to adjust our assumptions here about contact rate and infection probability to best match this. And you'll notice that the model is running several realizations. If you go look at this. It's actually running for each of these several replications, five per. I'm going to stop it again and, and start it from the get-go, just so you can 
you can get a sense of what it's like. So I in on unartfully switched over to that. It's running five times for each parameter value. So that each value of contact rate and infection probability it's exploring, it runs it five times. And each of those five yields a somewhat different result. And it's looking for the values of these parameters that will allow this to best match this yellow one. And you notice initially it's way, way, way off. That's the red. It's it's way off thus far from being able to match. It has a huge sum squared error term. Um, there's a huge discrepancy from the yellow. But over time, it's getting better and better. It's tuning these parameters so that they better and better match. The model's results better and better match the results from the world. You'll notice that over time, we see there's some variability. But by and large, the best results thus far, the best match is showing... Um, uh, showing a discrepancy from this observed yellow data that's smaller and smaller. In other words, it's getting better and better matches to this observed data. Do you see that? Okay, now, um, you'll notice as it goes on, it's tuning these values. It's It's honing in on good sets of parameter values. And there's still a lot of variability. It's it's not just getting smarter and smarter and smarter, but it is finding more and more savvy combinations that are best. And, and certainly the degree to which the models runs can on average match this historic data is getting better and better. This compared to this are getting closer and closer. Now, we do this to estimate the values of the parameters that we aren't very confident about and to test, can the model reproduce the data effectively? Calibration is a learning exercise. It's not merely a technical transactional step to be undertaken in a routinized way. No, 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 it's an opportunity to learn to what degree is the model successfully accounting for features of data. Right now, this is just one answer. But often, well, with many types, and it needs to be true to secure sufficient uh, fidelity to a wide variety of types of, 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 of data. And I'd like to go back to that adage, that old chestnut that I submitted to you many times in this boot camp, that structure drives behavior. And I'd like to go back to challenge that, that um, unfortunate misperception that no matter, that, that as you adjust parameters, you can match anything, anything with them all. And I, I argued from this floor that that's simply flatly untrue. And I'd like to show you why I say that. We're gonna take this model and we're going to go to person and we're gonna see the theory of personhood behind it. It's a particularly simplistic theory. One very similar to that with which we started this boot camp. Okay, now what I'm going to do mirrors what we did on the very first day of the boot camp. Nay, the first opening session of the boot camp. I'm going to go to the palette and I'm going to imagine Using equipped by mechanisms in the palette, I'm going to examine the impacts of people losing Im losing immunity in the model. How would I do that? How would what would I what transition would I add if I want to uh, imagine a situation where immunity wanes over time? From recovered to susceptible. That's exactly right. Recovered to susceptible. Wait, um, could you examine up close and pixelated fashion the screen and um, check whether it's your impression that that's normal degree of shimmering? Oh, I think that's... It looks to me... Bob, ear shimmering. Yes, I agree. It, it just... 
And it's not the video source because these monitors exhibit uh, very stable images. So it might be worth speaking as well with the tech staff and by extension ITS. So I'm gonna draw a, a, um, a transition back from recovered to susceptible. In, in short, I'm changing the theory captured in the model. What I showed you earlier was with a theory well aligned with the data. Um, Rauf passes and perhaps can be grabbed. Okay, so this transition will be waning of humanity. This will be waning of immunity. And we're going to put in a rate of waning of immunity of 1.0 divided by uh, 60.0. Someone short of about 60 days on average until immunity wanes. I've seen competing theories about, for example, chlamydia or gonorrhea, bacterial STIs, you know, there might be some short lived immunity. And I think it's, there's reason to doubt it. Um, but as Asab has noted, there may be some behavioral um, changes that essentially serve as some proxy for that. Here, this is going to lead on average about 60 days um, to one loses immunity. Do you think that will change the behavior of the model over time? Do you think changing the structure, adding waning of immunity could change the behavior? I, I see heads nodding, and I'm impressed that it's not from sleep. Um, so, so, uh, What's the question? Uh, so the question is, could changing the structure of this model in this way be changing the behavior, the outcome over time? Precisely, precisely. So, so exactly. So people are going to lose their immunity faster, and so more becomes susceptible, and it can spread further. So, so let's try matching this data with this new structure. Here we go. And do you see differences in how now the model's output looks different? How does it look different than before? Before it went way down and, and went almost to zero, right? And now we see it's not going down. It's it's becoming established endemic. It's it's staying high, right? That's exactly it. Structure determines behavior. We have a different structure here. And this structure, this structure we see before us now, um, excuse me, that I put there uh, and we'll see in just a moment. That structure, ladies and gentlemen, cannot match closely this sort of behavior in the yellow. Try as it might, it's just not going to be able to tune the parameters to match effectively this yellow structure. It's going to be unable to calibrate to that. You could put all sorts of different values for these parameters, and it's, it's just not going to be able to match this effectively. For these two parameters. That's an important lesson. Structure determines behavior. We we if we have a structure for the model that's incompatible at some level from the data that we have from the world, calibration um, becomes very difficult, if not impossible, because it just doesn't add up to be consistent with what we see from the world. And that's not a failure of the model. It's a success of model link because it's an opportunity to learn. This structure just doesn't seem compatible with what we're seeing from the world. And there's a natural question of looking for alternative structure. Yes, uh, there was a, a question online. Great. Maybe we will get to this, but where can you see the list of parameters that are being varied? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I will know this at two levels, Rachel, and I, I will turn to this in just a moment. One is um, 
at a most basic level with this particular interface shown here, which is hardly privileged, there it's tuning tuning these two. And and that's just because it's been told to, you know, display those. Um, uh, but by the way, I'll I'll go and I will uh ignore this now so we don't forever modify this model. Um, but in the calibration experiment, Rachel. If you go down to the parameters area, it tells it what parameters to adjust in calibration and over what range to adjust them. Okay. Um, this is the more fundamental thing. That other one that showed it was just the result of someone putting together a nice interface. This is telling the AnyLogic Calib optimization experiment how to adjust these parameter values, or, or how to adjust certain parameter values, what parameter values to adjust and over what range here. And we also have to specify what we're trying to match and what outcome to model are we trying to match. And we're trying to match outcomes from runs of the model and like for a parameter variation experiment, we get that information read out from the model after each simulation run. This is just what we did about half an hour ago. We read information out of the model following each simulation run so we could display it in that histogram. Here, we're reading information out from the model so we could save it away in what's called the data set in this experiment. And in that data set, lives lives here um, um for example uh, here's this data set current here's the historic data set and we are seeking to match those as closely as possible so we read data out from here from the model that's just run you may remember this root we use that that's referring to main it's reading this data set out and it's filling it into this. We have some historic data that was filled in earlier and we are matching the historic with the data from the model that we've read out from this model run and using, using that to judge the difference, the so-called discrepancy. And uh, as a result, um, we're trying to minimize this uh, this this difference, this discrepancy. So um, I have only you know brief additional comments here, but basically we're triangulating from diverse data sources. We're tuning the model to best match what the observed data tells us, uh, often across as much data as we can bring to bear that's observed from the world. Not data that can be put into parameters. There we can put it directly into parameters, but data that's emergent from the system in the world and that we can compare with emergent data from the, the simulation we have. And calibration helps us find, helps us validate, helps us cross-check, helps us falsify our dynamic hypothesis, helps us leverage a large amount of data we have that can't be stuck into the model directly, but to which the model has to hold true, has to mean secure fidelity. And how does it work? Well, it uses an optimization algorithm. That's why here, this cal calibration is conducted with an optimization experiment. And you can set it up with file, new, experiment, and choose an optimization experiment. Okay, um, so here we're, Optimizing. What are we optimizing? What are we adjusting? Does anyone want to offer a, 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 a positive conjecture? What are we optimizing? What are we changing as we optimize? What are we? We're changing something to get better and better something. What are we changing? Parameter or something for specified parameters. That is what is in here. No, we're, so we're modifying these assumptions. These ones are fixed. We're not changing those. We're changing these in some continuous value. So we're changing those and we're optimizing, trying to find the best values of these for to minimize this difference, this discrepancy between what comes out of the model 
and what's observed historically. Right now, this is just one term. In some models, like a model Wade did heavy lifting for, for paternal, um, excuse me, maternal immunization for pertussis, we might have had six different things we are trying to match, including um, values regarding age-specific prevalence and overall burden and and uh, the autocorrelation function between when it when you had outbreaks occurring and a, a, a set of other measures. Ladies and gentlemen, um, so we're optimizing here to minimize the difference between what the model produces and what we observe from the world. And we're tuning the parameters to find the best match between them, okay? So really to calibrate, we need to specify what we wanna match, what data, in this case, there's just a, that yellow curve. We want to specify what parameters to vary over what range to vary them, that's what this is. And we want to specify what optimization, what, like how long should we run the optimization and potentially what optimization engine. And here we can, we can use um, OptQuest, which is a popular um, global optimization tool um, that's widely used in some quarters of industry or a genetic algorithm to optimize. Um, it's a special type of optimization. And we can try to match um, uh, match the data. So really, we're sorry, we're trying to adjust several parameter values. I've called them here tau, mu, and beta, but you don't have to worry about the particular names. The idea is we have different values of these parameters. Just beta and with tau and found the best combination of them in terms of matching the curve data. We'll be exploring this gelatinous cube. Um, we'll be exploring this cube, okay? Um, and trying to get the model to best match the observed outcomes, okay? Um, okay. Um, so we need some way of quantifying goodness of fit. Any logic's default way is with this this um, difference and difference is defined basically as the sum squared difference. Um, so if you if you look, difference here um, uh, and I'm gonna have to, hey, oh uh, no, 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 difference here. I'm I'm getting uh, terrible at, at selecting these. Um, okay, difference. Different function, which is always non-negative and reflects the difference. Yes, um, particularly it's the square root of the average of the square of the difference between the two things given to it. So it's it's like the something like the sum squared difference uh, between the two, but with a square root of that. And it's actually um, the average um, of this. And I think the average is over different realizations, um, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, if you if you have several things you want to match, you'll watch. You know, um, model A, uh, model result A versus uh, empirical data uh, A, and then you might add to it here uh, for for model result B and whoa, um, for, for B and, and, and B, et cetera. Now that's naive. Um, generally you want these to be normalized by their size. So you don't want, if you have, you're trying to match cases and deaths, you don't treat cases as more important just because there's more of them and therefore the discrepancy is larger. You want these to be sort of percentile or, or proportional differences. Um, but um, that's covered elsewhere in the slide. So, so just be aware that commonly we have several things added up here that we're trying to match, okay? So a couple words of wisdom here um, before I, 
my stop here and I'm gonna close this off um, uh, so I don't save this away inadvertently. Um, yeah, so couple couple of comments. First of all, with calibration, particularly um, those from certain backgrounds, uh, modeling-wise, may be tempted to try to point match observations from the world, trying to exactly match what's observed from the world. That is possible in some cases, but a lot of the time, um, you, you look at childhood infectious diseases pre-vaccination, like chickenpox here, or or uh, pertussis in England and Wales, for example, or measles and mumps in Saskatchewan over decades and decades. Um, this is pre-vaccination from I think the twenties through um, through the fifties. When you have these sort of situations, it's often a fool's errand, absent. Absent a really sophisticated model use of empirical data, it's often a fool's errand to try to exactly match the timing of the peak. There's so much stochastics that trying to tune the model to exactly match timing is 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 um, often unrealistic. So what we often try to match is the tempo, the size range, the the spacing between these. And tools like autocorrelation functions, tools like uh, burden as a um, as a distribution, um, and uh, and tools about sort of average prevalence across different age groups, often turn out to be more helpful than trying to exactly match each um, each time point. Uh, so something along these here. This is from our um, and and Wade played. A leading role here. Um, uh, this is uh, sort of relative risk since last vaccine dose, cumulative density of yearly incidence across um, uh, different. Uh, so this is a yearly incidence. It's sort of a cumulative distribution. Um, so the distribution of, of, of different incidences across years, but a cumulative distribution, mean incidence, um, autocorrelation, in age distribution. Um, that model also matched contact patterns and compared that to um, mixing pattern measurements from, from uh, uh, published sources uh, from the polymod study, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, is that right, Wade? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go light on this. Um, I, I do a walkthrough of how this works quite carefully in any logic. Um, much of what I have in these slides mirrors what I've uh, been describing verbally, um, but you can find some additional uh, information uh, from the model. Um, right, or from, from these slides, right? Okay, um, good. So I think I'm gonna close calibration in the interest of getting on to hybrid modeling, um, except to say one final thing, which is calibration is a learning opportunity. Again, it's not a mechanical process. Um, trying to understand why a model is having problems matching data is often very important in calibration. And it's important not just to match it better, but to learn what is the data telling us about what's going on in the world? And often you learn something deep about either the process in the world as it's represented in the model, something that might lead you to modify the model, or, and this is important, it's occurred a half dozen times in my career, you learn something about the data. I've had roughly a half dozen times in my career where I just cannot get a model to match empirical data from the world. It will not match. And I figured there must be something quite off in my understanding of the world. And going to very knowledgeable parties, relevant experts in the area, having dialogues about why it's not matching, what I discover is that actually, sometimes the things I'm not matching are in fact problematic as data. 
They have systematic known issues that are directly affecting the fidelity of the map. And so I can't match it because the way in which the data was collected changed dramatically, or the, the meaning of what it meant, of, of what was included and excluded from the data changed. Or um, suddenly the, the scope, the, the jurisdiction started to collect data on additional areas as well. In short, you often learn something significant when there's a problem matching the data. It could be significant about the model or it could be significant about the data. So calibration is this learning opportunity. And um, if it's treated purely as mechanical, um, every time it can be it can it can be um, a missed opportunity. Okay. Um, I think we'll we'll leave that there. I will say that you know a lot of our work uh, leverages machine learning models these days, which try to um, reground a model continuously and observe data, um, inform a model with the very latest observations about the state of the model that allows it to project forward with very high confidence. Um, and uh, some of our main tools in this regard are something called particle filtering and particle MCMC. But applying these with agent-based models requires significant scientific work yet, and as well as engineering work. And um, we're not yet there fully to apply them reliably with agent-based models. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my comments here on calibration unless there are any questions, comments or concerns from the audience. And we're then gonna go on to hybrid models. Any questions? Any concerns? Comments? Okay. I am going to stop the recording.